Calimera and welcome to Stupid Ancient History, Stupid A-Level Greeks. It's a rainy December day and today we're going to look at the Persian Wars Part 2, particularly the Battle of Salamis. And as with the other videos we've done for the Persian Wars, this is going to be specifically looking at the idea of Greek relations and non-Greek relations in this particular event. Obviously the non-Greek relations are war with Persia, um, but I'm not necessarily going to look at the events and the details of the Battle of Salamis in a lot of detail. That's already been covered in the Persians podcast on the Battle of Salamis. What we're going to do in this video, to keep it as short as possible, is to look at some of these overarching themes, some of these overarching issues, and the ongoing difficulties that the Greeks faced when fighting the Persians. So previously when looking at the Persian Wars, we've looked at those opening conflicts of the war in 480. We've seen two significant battles, but there's been no clear outcome. We've seen the Battle of Thermopylae, the famous stand of the Spartans, where the Spartans offer up their king a sacrifice, they fight to the last, um, and they regain their honour. They regain any standing they may have lost after not turning up at Marathon. And we also see it's a Persian victory, Xerxes wins, but it's not a good victory. Given the weight of his army against such a small force, he claims victory, but it's not not a great one. It's the equivalent of kicking a three-legged kitten. But straight after that, we saw the Battle of Artemisium. Now, this is a bit more interesting in terms of Greek relationships, because even though at Thermopylae they've taken their role as leaders, they've done everything they should have done, and Artemisium, Sparta, Sparta, particularly Eurybiades, the general in charge of this force, the Spartans hand the reins to Athens, particularly to this emerging character, Themistocles. He's already quite a, made a name for himself in Athens, but he's really starting to come to prominence. So again, we see the Athenians taking the upper hand. And with this battle, it's a naval battle. There's no clear winner, but there is damage done particularly to the Persians who thought the Greeks wouldn't be able to offer up such a strong naval resistance um, and both sides ultimately continue with the conflict. The Greeks particularly head straight back to Athens or the Isthmus of Corinth to work out what to do next. So let's pick up back with this idea of the Greeks reassembling after these two battles. Um, and when we get to this this next meeting of the Greeks, it seems quite clear that there's no overarching strategy for the Hellenic League to actually defeat Xerxes in 480. The majority of the Hellenic forces, they do retreat to Athens and to the Isthmus of Corinth. Um, this is obviously Sparta and the Peloponnesians' default position. Everyone back to the Isthmus. This, they see, is the best place to fend off the Persian forces. It, we should point out here that the majority of the forces left standing against Xerxes are Peloponnesians. Um, they have had the least impact of this invasion. Given that they are at the south, they are protected by the Isthmus, they've been relatively unscathed. Um, we also know that Thebes have now Medes. They've, no, they've left the Hellenic League and they are now part of the Persian forces. I mean, playing devil's advocate, we can understand why. The sources obviously paint the Thebans as traitors, um, betraying the Greeks. But if we look at it sensibly from the point of view of Thebes, it makes relative sense. They've been abandoned almost by the majority of the Greeks. This policy of retreating to the Isthmus has the downside of abandoning everyone else in the wake of Xerxes' oncoming force. This is something that rears its head again. Um, so feeling abandoned by the majority of the Greeks, it seems realistically the Thebans have little or no hope of defending the city of Thebes against this massive Persian force. So it makes sense that the majority in Thebes would be swayed to Medes and try and ride out the storm as part of the Persian Empire. So they, they have effectively left the Hellenic League, so we now see with the coming of the Battle of Salamis and this ongoing conflict, we're really down to kind of the most dedicated Greek resistors. The Greek forces are dwindling, 
and the Persian forces just keep coming. And it's not just the Greeks that are heading full tilt towards Athens. Um, with the capitulation of Thebes, it doesn't take Xerxes' forces long to get to Athens, obviously after their little debacle at Delphi. When they get to Athens, however, um, they get to Athens and find a city that's virtually empty. The majority of the people have fled the city, they've abandoned the city, they've taken as much as they can with them and fled over the water to the island of Salamis. This is just off the coast of Athens um, and this is effectively where they want to defend themselves. They've abandoned the majority of the city. There are some who are left behind. Herodotus paints quite a grim picture saying basically they left the poor and the feeble and those who couldn't either pay for the voyage or couldn't make the voyage. Um, and they're joined by a small group who have barricaded themselves on the Acropolis in Athens. This is obviously in line with Aristides' interpretation of the omen that wooden walls will save Athens. So they're literally building wooden walls on the Acropolis to create their own little last stand. Needless to say, it doesn't take Xerxes very long to overcome this group, and once he's done that, he merrily burns Athens to the ground. Um, there's an obvious reason for this. Um, it is, to some extent, an extension of Xerxes' plan or his policy of demanding earth and water. This idea that the easiest way they will overcome the Greeks is to force them to surrender. Um, and his mindset is quite simple. If the Athenians have no homes to fight for, why would they continue fighting? What is it they're actually fighting for? Obviously, according to the Athenians and the Athenian sources, they're fighting for democracy and the freedom of all Greece. To some extent, they see the physicality of Athens, the actual city itself, as it's important to them, it is their homes, but they like to think of themselves as fighting for greater ideals. Either way, the burning of Athens is meant to send a massive shock, a huge blow to the Greek resistors. Almost a reminder of this is what happens if you stand against the Persians. And let's not forget the whole point of this invasion. It's revenge for the Athenian involvement in the Ionian revolt. Remember the Athenians, that old line. So Xerxes on one hand has definitely fulfilled his dad's wishes and remembered the Athenians with great vigour. So if we think of the backdrop to this next bit as Athens merrily burning off in the background, um, our attention now has to shift to these combined Greek forces um, and particularly again the role of Themistocles. So needless to say this attack on Athens and the destruction of the city has obviously prompted some debate amongst this combined Greek force. Um, at this point with the people the majority of the Greek force is now moored just off the shores of Salamis and they are busily fortifying the island. The navy are fixing the ships, the people are helping the what soldiers are left build makeshift fortifications on the island. But with the site of Athens on fire, it, it digs up this perennial problem, these differences within the Hellenic League. And it's no surprise, and it won't shock anyone, that with the site of Athens burning, the Peloponnesians and the Spartans and the majority of the Greek forces, they obviously think now is the time to obviously retreat to the Isthmus, the Isthmus of Corinth. There's no, They see no value in fighting off the shores of Attica or trying to salvage any victory here because they see in their mind with Athens on fire the Persians have now taken Attica. This doesn't particularly sit nicely with Themistocles, he's got other ideas so there's obviously we're back to the same old Greek debate where to fight, where to fight the Persians and what to do next. The problem for Themistocles is that now the strength of opinion is pressed against him. So if we look particularly at the role of Themistocles in these upcoming discussions, again, there is a degree of focus on individuals with 
this ongoing conflict. It, if you put yourself in Themistocles' mindset now, he's effectively facing two enemies. The obvious enemy are the Persians, who burned his city and threaten everything he stands for, his ships, his men, his life. The other enemy that's there in the background and probably coming more to the front now is the other Greeks, particularly the Peloponnesians. They stand to bail on him and allow the Persians an even greater foothold on the mainland. He's clearly not a fan of this idea. So when we get to this Greek debate about what to do, we're seeing that throughout this council, Themistocles continuously and passionately argues his point. This is something, again, if we look at Plutarch's biography of Themistocles, this is something he's got a natural gift for, and he is convincing. And ultimately, he does persuade Eurybiades, the de facto leader of the Greek resistance at this point, he does persuade Eurybiades to actually stay and put up a spirited defence, defend Greece at this point with all the strategic benefits the terrain allows them. He persuades Eurybiades to make the move to stay at Salamis and fight the Persians. But again, this is Themistocles. He's a bit savvy. He's not going to take things on face value. Regardless of what Eurybiades promises, and it seems Eurybiades has learned the benefit of listening to Themistocles after their previous engagement at Artemisium. Themistocles is not convinced about the resolution of the rest of the Peloponnesians. He, he himself has challenged Eurybiades' leadership in the past and gone against him, and he's pretty sure now that regardless of what Eurybiades says, some of the more reticent Peloponnesians will abandon the fight and leave the others to take on Persia. Any loss of numbers at this point Themistocles sees as absolutely catastrophic. So any plan that he has to come up with has to not only effectively defeat the Persians, but also he has to make sure he keeps the Peloponnesians where he needs them, where he wants them, and to stop them running off. So, luckily from what we know about Themistocles, the man is a master hustler. He knows this situation is dire, and he's got to make sure he can fight the Persians with a full contingency, and he knows he cannot necessarily trust the Peloponnesian commanders. So what he does, he resorts to a kind of very desperate measure, and he sends a trusted slave to Xerxes as an official emissary of his, um, Xerxes has obviously heard who he is, he's aware of Themistocles as a leader of the Athenians. Um, and he actually acknowledges this and receives this, this slave, this messenger. Now this is interesting because it not only speaks of a level of distrust within the Greek camp, but also there's a kind of pattern event of events emerging from the Persian side. And we've got to look at, well, why does Xerxes fall for this this trick that Themistocles is effectively going to pull on him. So, if we look, break it down, we know, Xerxes knows, that the Greeks' unity are shaky, is shaky. This is what he's relying on, ultimately. I mean, even if we go back to the Battle of Ephesus during the Ionian Revolt, where the Athenians ran off, or the Battle of Laid, where um, half of the Ionian forces change sides just before the battle. He knows the Greeks are shaky, so he's hoping this is going to be his way into splitting the Greeks. We've also got to look at his strategy of earth and water. This whole gambit is designed to break the Greek will and split the Greeks who do not trust each other or like each other at the best of times. Obviously bolstered by the Medization of Thebes, it's clear from Xerxes' point of view that it's starting to work. It makes sense to him, in his mind, that Athens would capitulate, their city's on fire, Thebes have done it before, so why not Athens? The third thing we look at is, with Athens burning, again in the Persian mindset, why it makes sense that the Athenians would reach out to him. They've got nothing left to fight for, so why wouldn't they barter some kind of negotiation? Again, pile on top of this, we can see from Xerxes' point of view, 
Themistocles' message seems an act of desperation. You know, the Greeks are effectively trapped um, in the Saronic Gulf around Athens. They are fish in a barrel, as far as Xerxes can see, and all he's got to do is tighten that net. So again, makes sense. And, you know, adding more fuel to Xerxes is fine. He's already killed one king of Sparta, you know. Um, working in this kind of Persian mindset where so much is reliant on the leader, the single leader, in this case Xerxes, he sees that, well, surely the Greeks have got no, no real leadership left. You take out the leader, you take out the king, everything collapses. In Persian terms, yeah, we can see this is very much the case. But let's not forget, the Greeks are quite different. Um, so it, it's relatively easy to understand why Xerxes takes this news with such vigour, rather than sitting back and thinking, hang on a minute, this is Themistocles just hustling me. So job one for Themistocles is to sort out the Peloponnesians and this is what the messenger does he plugs this gap so the messenger falsely informs Xerxes of a plan to escape from Salamis to the west around the rear of the island he's effectively he's making the Persians think they're gonna know they know what the Greeks are gonna do first um, and the slave and Themistocles's message convinces Xerxes to deploy his Egyptian fleet they're not the best of his fleet they're not the strongest contingent, but you know he's got ships to spare. He gets Xerxes to deploy his Egyptian fleet to the western cape of the island of Salamis to act as a barrier. This will block the Greeks in an even smaller space, a more confined space, where in Xerxes' mind, and according to this Mysticles' plan, the Persians just simply have to squeeze and increase the pressure. And, like a good boy, Xerxes does exactly what Themistocles tells him. He thinks, yeah, this is a good idea, cheers for the hint, um, let's do that. Again, if you look at Xerxes' previous encounters with the Greeks, you can argue that the only reason Thermopylae fell when it did was because they were betrayed by Ephialtes. Xerxes clearly thinking he's on a roll, brilliant, someone's told me my neck, this is the naval version of the goat path, let's go with it. So he, he does exactly what Themistocles tells him to do. Once this has happened, Themistocles then informs the rest of the Greek forces where the Egyptians are, and they will have seen the fleet getting into position on that western cape of Salamis. So there is no hope for escape. The argument now of retreating to the Isthmus is now dead in the water. Um, if they were to do that, they'd have to fight through the Egyptians. No one really seems up for that. Themistocles has now ensured that the combined fleet is stuck where it is. They listen a bit more intently to Themistocles now because he's orchestrated this situation where this is now the battle. There's no running away. The arguments about the Isthmus are done. One way or another, the Greeks are going to fight off the coast of Salamis, and this is where they're going to fight the Persians. So job one, Peloponnesians sorted, now for job two, the Persians. And the second part of Themistocles' bluff, again, all with this message from the slave, uh, it relies on Themistocles being able to exploit um, Xerxes' presumed understanding of the Greeks. Again, this idea that they're just going to buckle and shatter and split up and turn on each other. So once the Egyptian fleet, the part of the plan where the Egyptian fleet get in place, the second part, again, relayed by the slave in this same quite lengthy message, the slave then tells Xerxes that Themistocles and the Athenians have no will to fight him. They're effectively convincing him that his burning of Athens has done the trick, that the Athenians have no stomach for the fight, um, that they're there under duress, and they have no real intention for sticking it to the Persians. So the slave and the message convinces Xerxes that the Athenians under Themistocles will pose no real threat in the battle, that they will either fight so poorly as to not be anything to worry about, or just simply run away. And again, 
Xerxes falls for it. Um, without wanting to be too scathing of Xerxes, it's very easy to look back and say, well, what's he playing at? What an idiot. Obviously, this is a trick. Um, it's not. And from his point of view, this is following the pattern of everything he's seen so far when fighting the Greeks. Um, again, back to the Ionian Revolt. The Ionians switched sides quite readily. Um, the Athenians switched sides after the Battle of Ephesus. They seem very much, in Xerxes' mind, like fair-weather friends. They are not the stubborn, dogged Spartans who will fight to the death. They will fight as long as the fighting is good, but as soon as you start applying pressure to them, in Xerxes' mind, they will buckle and they will run off. So Xerxes falls for it. And really, this is why Themistocles is the master hustler of ancient Greece. He's done the one thing that all military commanders ideally want to do before a battle, and that's know what the enemy's battle plan is. It's one step forward. Themistocles has effectively planned Xerxes' attack, his plan of attack, for him. But he's also planned it in such a way that Xerxes is going to fall flat on his face. It's all going to go terribly for him if Xerxes does what Themistocles suggests, which, as we've seen, he does. But as powerful as Xerxes is, there's still protocol to go through before actually fighting the battle. But clearly pleased by this news from Themistocles, Xerxes gathers his commanders, his council of war, um, to quite functionally, perfunctory, ask their opinions, let them know what he's thinking, and let them know what he's found out. Now, we're told that almost all of these commanders are positive in their praise for Xerxes' leadership, that he is absolutely the God King, and they understand that, yep, yeah, this is the way we're going to do it. But there's one exception, uh, and this is a commander called Artemisia. Now, Artemisia, again, if we're looking at this idea of Greek relations and individuals, she's really, really interesting. Um, Artemisia is not only interesting in that she's a sole leader who is a woman. You know, this is very, very unusual. She is the queen of Halicarnassus, and she has ruled Halicarnassus since the death of her husband. And rather than stepping down, as would be quite traditional in these cases, she's continued to rule Halicarnassus on her own. She's not giving up power. Um, it's also worth pointing out that Halicarnassus is Herodotus's hometown, so this is probably a bit of him kind of flagging up his hometown hero, a bit of a reference to his hometown, and look, you know, we're not all me absolute me dies, it's a little more complicated than that and again she is greek so don't forget at this point a large chunk of the persian navy are ionian greeks she's also really interesting that despite being a woman she is one of the most respected naval commanders of the time she has this reputation of being a skilled naval commander which is almost unheard of in the greek world so she comes with a fair degree of gravitas. She's clearly a woman who's used to speaking her mind. She's not one to kowtow down to men just because she's a woman. And she, in this meeting, says what she thinks. And she says, no. She says, you're an idiot. Do not sail your massive fleet into that narrow pass where the Athenians, particularly the Greek navy, will completely outmatch you. The advantage is on their side. And you the Persian forces will become, they will become the fish in the barrel. You, she says, if you wait out at sea, let the Greeks come to you, you can use your numbers wisely. You can easily crush the Greeks. Going into the Straits of Salamis, though, she says, is a fool's errand and it's going to end badly. Xerxes listens to her advice, um, but ultimately, quite flippantly, his response is, yeah, I see what you're saying there, but, you know, the lads want to go in, so we're going to go in. Her wise counsellor, dissenting voice, her wise, you could even say her wise Greek voice, this idea that the Greeks are strategically more adept than the Persians. Um, she, he listens to her, but ultimately says, no, I'm the God King, doing what I say, now let's get on with it. So let's get on with the battle. 
So despite Artemisia's warning, the Persians duly sail straight into the Straits of Salmis. They just pile straight in. Xerxes makes sure he's got a nice view. He sits himself on top of a hill so he can oversee the battle. He wants to see his great victory unfold. He also has this idea that if the Persian forces, if his forces can see the god king overseeing their progress, they'll fight a bit harder. Um, and yeah, as they start sailing in, the battle begins pretty much as we would expect. But certainly not as Xerxes would expect. You know, he's still not realised the Mystocles is hustling him all along. He thinks, obviously, the Athenians, after the Mystocles' message, are of little threat to his force. He's expecting them to run away. So the best parts of the Persian force, the Ionian navy, they concentrate on the Peloponnesian and other allied forces. Um, this is a bad idea. They send the good ships, the good sailors to deal with the Peloponnesians and leave the kind of... his B team, his second rate sailors, to go and effectively just try and scare off the Mystocles. This is a really bad idea because we know, as unlike Xerxes, that Themistocles has no intention of running away. He's just trying to expose a weak point in the Persian force. And this is exactly what he does. Themistocles and the Athenians are able to outmaneuver these Persians as soon as they see them coming. Uh, and they set off and manage to outflank the Persian forces so they can get to that also important weak side of the ships. And they start doing what the Athenian navy does best. They simply start crashing through rows and rows of Persian ships, um, completely outskilling them, sinking them left, right and centre. And it becomes a bit of a bloodbath. The Persians are trapped. The smaller Athenian ships are much quicker. They're more manoeuvrable. The Persians have exposed their weak sides to the Athenians. And Themistocles and his ships are exploiting this as hard and as fast as they can. It is a bloodbath. So rather than going into the kind of the specifics and the details of the actual fight, um, there are a couple of good instances in the battle that we can focus on to look at this idea of relationships and the vying for position. And the first goes back to Artemisia. Remember she thought this was a bad idea and as she sails into the Straits of Salamis, obeying her king, she sees that straight away this battle is a complete disaster. Everything she said was going to happen is happening, and she's had enough of it. So she turns her ship around and leaves. In doing so, she crashes straight through another Ionian ship, straight through one of Xerxes' ships. Again, if we look at Xerxes' leadership, he sat on his mountain watching things going on. He sees this and proclaims just how well his forces are doing. Look how well Artemisia is doing. She's just sunk that ship. Until someone points out to him that actually that's one of his ships she's sunk and she's doing a runner. Um, again, this is even more interesting because there's some speculation as to whether... Artemisia crashed into them by accident, out of an act of panic, something we've seen quite typically with Persian land forces when things start to go wrong, or whether she was settling an old score. Um, the ship she crashes into is certainly commanded by one of her rivals. Is she simply taking out, um, settling old scores while she can during the battle? It's a bit of a bonus. Um, what is certain though is this is a really good, her actions are a really good illustrator of the kind of the crumbling Greek support for Xerxes from the Asiatic and Ionian Greeks. This is something that becomes a bigger issue later on, this idea of whose side are they on and to what extent can the Ionian Greeks be relied on to serve others rather than their own interests. And this becomes a massive theme throughout the rest of the century. But it's not all hunky-dory on the Greek side either, so we've got another good example um, to really highlight these tensions within the Greek world. Another good example is to look at the story of the Corinthian contingent. 
Herodotus reluctantly puts forward this story that the Corinthians, once the battle has begun, decide to break away and sneak off, effectively do a runner before anything bad happens. They do this until supposedly they come across a ghost ship, which then convinces them to turn around and join the fight. Now we should definitely point out at this point that if Herodotus doesn't believe it, then you know it's a pretty ropey account. Herodotus is well known for including the tales that he has been told, um, but he does point out that this he doesn't necessarily believe. He does point out that this is an Athenian story, given that the majority of his sources are Athenian. And he says this has simply been put out, or large been put out, to one glorify the achievements of Athens in the Battle of Salamis, but also to discredit Corinth. Um, because Corinth and Athens are staunch rivals. They both, they're arguably more aggressive towards each other than Athens and Sparta. They, they both see themselves as rising naval powers. So anything the Athenians can do to discredit the Corinthians will not only add to their glory, but also discredit the Corinthians. And again, this becomes the root illustrator of an ongoing rivalry and conflict throughout the century. So while all these tensions in Greece that will play out throughout the rest of the century are being nicely illustrated within the actual Battle of Salamis, we now need to shift our focus to Xerxes. And misguided as Xerxes' leadership seems to be, it soon becomes clear to him that the battle is lost. He's been outplayed. Um, and this is where we see a degree of self-preservation kick in for Xerxes particularly. He, in his position as a god king, is very aware that all eyes are on him. So, feigning a renewed attack, he orders his men to start lashing hulls of ships together as if they're going to mount another attack on Salamis Island, almost sending the troops. Now, Herodotus gives us the view that his one of his men commanders Mardonius knows exactly what Xerxes is actually planning that rather than attacking the Greeks on Salamis he is preparing to flee and this is exactly what he does um, Xerxes uses this commotion and this renewed activity to pack his things up and start doing a runner um, and he leaves Mardonius behind to try and salvage what he can from the battle um, in terms of Mardonius' motives. We know Mardonius thinks he bears a lot of responsibility for this campaign. They're effectively using his plan. Does he, whether he's trying to save his forces or save his own reputation, we can't ultimately be sure, but we do know he stays and he conducts the end stages of the battle, trying to salvage anything he can. Obviously, with the flight of Xerxes, though, this in the Athenian mindset definitely seems to be this is it this is the battle where the Persians have lost and this is what the Athenians can use in the following years to promote the fact that they are the ones who defeated Persia the Athenians defeated the Persians at the point where Xerxes run that's the turning point this was an Athenian victory and it's fair to say that they're not 100% wrong. Certainly, they're exaggerating points, but they're not 100% wrong. So, following the, the flight of Xerxes, the, the Persian fight crumbles. Um, they see their leader gone, and as we've seen in previous battles, with no kind of top-down leadership, the Persians crumble, they capitulate, they effectively start retreating and they know they've lost. So in summary, what we see with the Battle of Salamis, aside from the strategy and the military tactics and the conflict that's going on, we see it as a good illustrator of these recurring and repeating issues. And these issues stay with us for the rest of the century. We see a conflict in strategy between the Peloponnesians and the Athenians. So we see again this Spartan isolationism um, kick in, this idea of return to the Isthmus, defend the Peloponnese. This is isolationism rather than strategy to defeat the Persians. We've seen this before with Sparta. 
when they refused to take part in the Ionian Revolt. Um, you can argue that not turning up at Marathon, Carnea was a nice excuse for not going beyond the Peloponnese. It's something that we will see again. The Spartans do not change their spots. So their strategy of retreating to the Isthmus is self-preservation and isolationism, something that will become synonymous with Sparta throughout the century. Similarly, we see Athens are back on the rise. They've claimed themselves as heroes of Greece after Marathon, and now they're doing the same. Again, Themistocles is just catapulting himself into the role of the popular hero. He again has taken the command of the navy away from Eurybiades by consent. It shows not only a real lack of Spartan leadership, which again something, another idea that you can accuse Sparta of throughout the century, um, it happens here. Spartan leadership has effectively given way to Athenian tactical brilliance. We see a crumbling Greek support for Persia. The Ionians are shifting their allegiance. So we've got to remember these relationships are not fixed. Uh, certainly if you were Thebes at this point and seeing the Ionians turn on the Persians after you've just medized, you would be sensing some doubt. Again, into all this, we see the Greek infighting, the slander of the Corinthians. Um, the Thebans already medized are regularly referred to as you know firm friends of the Persians so again the Persians invasion if anything drove the the, the Greeks closer together as their dominance is dying out it's splitting that apart we also see an emerging dominance of naval warfare this is again something that's going to continue throughout the century but also we see a kind of growing Greek confidence. They've defeated arguably the world's first superpower. They've defeated the God King, particularly the Athenians. And as they see it, following the Battle of Salamis, the world is their oyster. But the question then for Athens is, well, what do we do with this oyster? So there you have it, a quick overview of the impact of the Battle of Salamis on changing Greek relations. Apologies, it is quite long, it is quite complicated, there isn't really an easier way to do it. But what you'll find hopefully is that the Battle of Salamis acts as an early marker for a lot of these ongoing attitudes and conflicts throughout the century. That hopefully later events won't come as much of a surprise. Thank you for listening. I hope this has been useful. As always, leave us a comment below at the bottom. And until next time, goodbye.